Hi, everyone. So welcome to a little question and answer session with some of our lovely English department professors. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about online learning and online teaching today. So we're super glad that you guys are all here. Um, I just wanted to start out really quick by mentioning that this Zoom call is being recorded and it will actually be uploaded to our Canvas site. Um, so that students who are hoping to learn a little bit more about online teaching will be able to access it later. Um, so if you don't want your face to be seen, if you don't want uh, your name to be seen, just make sure to keep your camera off throughout the whole thing. But you are all more than welcome to ask questions in the chat and we'll make sure to get those questions out to our lovely professors. Um, so we have two professors here today. Uh, we have Dr. Baxter and Dr. Rouse, and I'll get them to introduce themselves in a second. Um, but we are super glad that you guys are all here and we're excited to chat a little bit more about what online English classes the upcoming semester might look like. Um, so maybe we'll start with you, Dr. Rouse, if you don't mind introducing yourself and maybe a little bit about what you do. Of course, um, I'm, uh, so my name's Robert Rouse. I'm an associate professor in the Department of English uh, at UBC. Um, I've spent the summer chairing our online working, online teaching working group, so reading far too much about online teaching, as we've been making this pivot across to the online platform in the uh, face of the ongoing pandemic. Um, in my teaching life, I teach medieval literature and I teach medievalism, so a combination of uh, the real Middle Ages and the imagined Middle Ages, and I also teach a little bit of environmental literature from time to time as well. Very, very cool. I know, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Rouse, but uh, your your reputation preceded you because you did a Game of Thrones class. <laughs> Right. Yeah, so I, I reprised my Game of Thrones class, English 247, over the summer um, for two reasons. One, it's a very popular course that I teach every couple of years, and also we used it as a little bit of an experimentation lab for online teaching techniques. Um, so I personally could figure out how it works, um, but also so we could use some of those ideas, strategies, and techniques um, for advising our colleagues going into semester one. Very, very cool. Um, Dr. Baxter, do you mind introducing yourself and telling us a little bit more about you? Sure. Um, I'm Giselle Baxter. I've been teaching sessionally in the English department now for 23 years. I'm about to start my 24th year. And my own areas of interest, I teach Victorian literature, I teach Gothic literature, near future dystopian literature, and a whole lot of other things, children's lit. Uh, I actually got involved with this online teaching uh, endeavor uh, when we shifted into panic mode in, uh, in March, and I've been teaching through the summer, so I've had some opportunity to work on online formats for, for my courses, both a first year course and an upper level, uh, upper level course. Uh, I've actually been using learning management systems like Canvas now for almost 20 years and have been writing and teaching uh, distance ed style online courses for almost that long actually. So I have quite a lot of experience. I was an early adopter of the internet and I'm fond of putting in my social media profiles, I've been online since 1992. Wow, very cool. Awesome. So speaking of online, kind of first very general question, what might online classes be like? What are some things that you guys took into consideration when you were kind of constructing online courses? Um, and what might students be expecting in the upcoming semester? Oh, I guess either of you. Uh, you want to lead off yeah, Robert, go for it. Do you want me to do this or? Well, why don't you lead off and then I can. <laughs> okay. Um, First of all, online courses, at least in the English department, are going to be offered on the Canvas Learning Management Systems platform. So when you find your online course, that's where you're going to find it. You'll log in, you'll see a whole lot of course cards on your dashboard, and you'll find the appropriate, uh, appropriate course there and enter it. Once you've entered it, that's the point at which you might see some differentiation among the, among the courses, because while the shells are built by uh, IT services, uh, the instructors are responsible for a lot of the actual content. So you might see some difference between the courses, but what you're going to find, and this is something that I'm also a member of the online working 
te online teaching working group um, <laughs> and have, have been designing a Canvas site specifically for, uh, specifically for that or working on a Canvas site specifically for, uh, for that. Uh, one thing that we have uh, you know, agreed on is that the courses will be run as a sort of combination of synchronous and asynchronous components. And that's simply a fancy way of saying that there will still be as with traditional conventional classroom based courses, there still will be some things that students will be expected to do in real time. And it might be, for example, watch live video, uh, video lectures. But there'll also be some things that while the courses will not become work at your own pace courses, and that's very important to remember that they will follow the same sort of pace and structure over 13 weeks that you could expect if you were taking them as, cl as classroom courses. Uh, that there will also be some elements that you'll have a little more time flexibility concerning, and that could be anything from uh, maybe watching pre-recorded material to participating in text-based online discussion groups. Okay, well, I clear my throat, Robert, do you want to? <laughs> yeah, I guess asking <coughs> the question of what will the courses be like um, really presupposes the, the hidden question there of how will they be different from normal, everyday, face-to-face -face English courses that you may have taken in the past. And I think at their heart, they remain the same kind of uh, structural intent. We read texts, we think about texts, we discuss texts, and then we write about texts. At the heart, these are still gonna be just just like your traditional English course. As Giselle pointed out, the, the, the structure that supports or allows these courses to operate is going to be a little different. Um, there's going to be a little bit more structured from time to time. There'll be some aspects of recorded lecture as well as live discussion groups, depending on the uh, course that you're taking. But at the heart, our discipline is fortunate in that uh, we can translate to the online environment in a way that causes minimal disruption, I think, to, to the essential being of an English course, which is writing and thinking about literature um, as a community of learners. Very cool. Um, Robert, you touched on it a little bit, but I would like to ask, um, what, what are some of the ways in which students might get tested? Specifically, this seems like a weird segue, but uh, a lot of what you're talking about is reading text, uh, interpreting texts and then trying to write and think about them. Um, yeah. Are you, are we uh, going to expect a lot of essay style uh, final exams? Do you think final exams will change all that much? Um, what should well, students be looking for about that? It, it, it's a great question because students are often uh, understandably anxious about how assessments can operate, especially in the, the strange world of online education. Um, I would say that, again, as following Giselle's earlier point, that uh, our colleagues are free to do what they wish in terms of assessment. So there will be a variety of different assessments, as okay. there always are. Um, we've encouraged colleagues to think more about the, about the argumentative essay um, as the primary mode of assessment rather than the kind of short answer midterms or final exams that we often see, especially in upper year English courses. Um, there's a number of reasons for this. Uh, the logistics of holding final exams are tricky and problematic, uh, especially if you have a class that is, that is comprised of people in diverse time zones. You really don't want to be forcing someone to do a 3A in final exam. And there are also certain technological challenges around um, academic integrity when it comes to final exams. Now, many of these uh, challenges and many of these uh, structural issues about time zones can be overcome through moving towards a more essay-based kind of assessment system, which is, again, not unusual for an English course, but I think we're going to see a little bit more emphasis on that and a little less emphasis on the final exam structure. The one exception to this will be the big first year English 110 classes mm -hmm. for those students who are taking those. All, where all first year courses. All first year courses. Yeah, all really. first year courses are required to have synchronous. Uh, yeah, where, where, we are, where we are um, uh, in many ways uh, um, forced to hold exams due to the, the nature of first year courses. But, but many of the second and third and fourth year courses will be more flexible in, in the way in which assessment operates. 
Okay. So a lot of the courses that are going to be uh, specifically looked at for art students and especially English department students will be looking at more essay-based final exams. Giselle, did yeah. you have anything? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, when we were told that we could, uh, you know, if we were teaching second year to and upper year, upper year courses, that we had flexibility concerning uh, assessments and concerning how we were going to treat the final exam, uh, we were given the option of, for example, simply dropping the exam and shifting the assessment weight to material that students would produce in term or going to a sort of take-home exam model where students might have a longer window, not a synchronous two-hour window in which to write it, but might have up to a week to produce something that might be the equivalent in terms of the essay requirements. In other words, it wouldn't be as reliant on, re on secondary research. It might be more involved with the uh, close reading analysis of primary uh, of primary course texts, but we have been given quite a lot of flexibility with uh, our second year and upper level courses in that regard. Uh, I will say that in the summer I taught both a first year course, which was, um, was considered for summer a large 110 with one TA. So there were about 75 students in the, in the class. And we actually had to have two short synchronous assignments and the synchronous exam. And I was really astounded at how smoothly it went. I really found that the students really stepped up. They were committed, they were enthusiastic. They got everything in on time. I didn't have to cajole anybody. Uh, and then in term two, I taught an upper level course in 19th century uh, studies. And that one I decided to go with the, the take home model. So I gave them a number of prompts and you know dealing with course concerns and some flexibility in terms of what texts they could apply them to, but required them within a week to produce two short, no research, close reading based analyses of these, uh, of these texts. And again, I was really touched, astounded, happy at any rate uh, with, uh, you know, with, the, with the level of response and the willingness to, uh, to make this work. So even though it sounds like uh, synchronous examinations might not be a huge thing to worry about, what advice would you have for students who are dealing with internet issues or uh, different time zones? Um, I know the obvious answer is letting you guys know as soon as possible, um, but what would you suggest to students who are worried about examinations or even just assignments uh, okay, dealing I'll, with those kind of issues? I'll actually take that up because one thing that I have been doing this very week is for the past, this is the fourth year I've done it, I do a series of technical writing workshops for incoming students in the Masters in Food Science program, which I, I I can honestly say I didn't even know existed until I inherited this uh, this gig, and uh, it's lovely. I mean, I really enjoy working with the working with the students, and I've really enjoyed uh, you know delivering live lectures to them. But this year, of course, we had to shift the whole thing onto Canvas and offer it wholly online. Uh, the students mostly come from abroad that this is a program where most of the students are from outside Canada and some of them have of course opted to remain uh, remain abroad and several of them apparently have internet issues that when I'm doing the workshops their internet keeps uh, keeps cutting out. Now I'm not using Zoom for these, I'm still using Collaborate and it allows a function of recording and then storing the recording on the Canvas site. It can't be downloaded from there, it has to be stored on the Canvas site. And one thing we decided to do with that, even though the workshops themselves are scheduled for 90 minutes, was to keep the recordings relatively short, to break up the workshop into chunks and maybe only record for about 30, uh, 30 minutes. And then, uh, when the recordings go online, if somebody you know happens to miss out on them, I must say that attendance has been very good. You know, when I look out at the screen, there are I think 35 people in the class, and I always see that there are 35 people there. Uh, but if uh, their internet keeps cutting out, the recording itself is fine. 
So all they need to do then later is go into the Collaborate site and, uh, and watch the recording. So I, I think as a sort of going forward, you know, question of or issue of applicability with this in the courses that we're going to be conducting this fall, it's more an issue of having a sort of backup plan so that if, for example, you know, I have good Wi-Fi at home, but you know, you never know. If there's a power outage, my modem will go off and my internet will go off and you know, I'll have my computer and battery power with no internet. Uh, so you need a sort of backup plan, uh, a contingency plan. What if these sorts of emergencies arise? What are alternate ways that you might use of delivering the course material? And one that I have is really quite old school, but it is one that I used during the March, what I call the March emergency, the March-April emergency, was coming up with old style lecture notes. Uh, I decided in that intense period when I was teaching full time and had many students, uh, I didn't yet want to deal at the same time with the learning curve of learning how to do live video lectures. So what I did was I opened up the discussion forums and uh, on Canvas because I've always used learning management systems to augment my classroom courses. I've been doing this for 20 years. So they already had a Canvas site and we're making a lot of use of it. So I opened up the discussion forums and I would go into the forum during class time and I'd post some lecture notes with links and questions. And then I'd stick around in there and sort of engage them in discussion. And I thought, oh, this won't work. No, students who never would have said a word in class were jumping in there and they were chatting with me and they were chatting with each other. So uh, I found that worked really well as a backup plan then, of course. I could take my discussion response and copy paste it into a PDF. So I had lecture notes that I could post in the modules that I set up on Canvas for them. That so yeah, you need, you, need, you need a contingency plan. Backup plans, always helpful. Uh, Dr. Rouse, do you have any tips for students that might be having issues with time zones or internet, yeah, anything like that? I, I do have a few that comes from the experience over summer. Um, you know, you, you pointed out the obvious one at the start, get in touch with the professors early, tell them your situation. If you are, you know, if you have long-standing issues with a particular course or a particular course time zone or technology, let, let us know because we will, we have been tasked by the university to be flexible and generous in terms of our approach to issues and problems this year for obvious reasons. Um, but there's also going to be problems that come up during the semester and during the, the year, we can now call it, since the call was made yesterday, that, um, that, that, that are unpredictable. And, you know, there's going to be, you know, you're going to have students in places who are currently in a particular state of lockdown. Perhaps that state of lockdown will change. We may get fall surges in various parts of the country, which is going to put various pressures and stresses on students and their families all over the place. Who knows what's going to happen? It's very, very unpredictable over the next six to eight months. You know, hopefully things will run smoothly, but I very much doubt they will all the time. Um, in those situations, you know, don't panic. You know, if for some reason you lose access to the internet for a week and come back, don't panic, like tell your professors what have happened. Um, accommodations will be made. Um, systems will be put into place to help you finish your courses because we know there's gonna be small and large disruptions around the world in various different places and probably here in British Columbia as well from time to time over the next, uh, over the next six to eight months. Um, I do have an anecdote that sort of follows up on that. One of my students in one of my summer courses uh, emailed me at one point uh, to say that the student was returning home abroad. And given the protocols in place where the student was uh, arriving, uh, the student actually had to quarantine in a military camp for two weeks where there was little or no internet, uh, internet access. 
And so, you know, obviously was not going to be able to contribute to discussion. Uh, another one of my backup plans is when I post notes on Canvas, I always post them in a PDF format. I mean, if I produce them, I make sure I put my watermark and copyright notice on them. But I put them in PDF because they're easily downloadable. They can really be read on virtually any device. So they're not specific to a particular program. Uh, any device has a PDF reader of some sort. So my student was actually, and I was really, again, amazed at the diligence with which this person did this, did all those readings. Then when the student was able to leave the military camp and, you know, go and join, uh, join the family, uh, caught up quickly and just progressed through the term, ended up being one of the, one of the best students in the class. Uh, not so much in terms of grades, but in terms of, of diligence and commitment and enthusiasm and improvement. So. Wonderful. I like that. Great story about flexibility. Yeah, military bases. Yikes. Um, you, Giselle, you've been speaking quite a bit about Canvas, um, which is kind of the obvious go-to resource hub for online courses. Uh, do you guys, through talking with colleagues or even within your own planning courses, what other platforms, if any, do you plan on using uh, that students should maybe start familiarizing themselves with? Okay, uh, for one thing, and this again is one of those issues where there might be a difference from instructor to instructor. The shells for all of the courses will be on Canvas. That that's the learning management system that uh, the Faculty of Arts, uh, Arts uses. So that's where what we might think of as a base camp will be. Because I want to make sure that everything I do with the courses is FIFA compliant, compliant with British Columbia's Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act, I want to use only applications that are embedded within Canvas. That actually gives us quite a lot of, uh, quite a lot of flexibility. Uh, for example, the one that I have I've mentioned that I have been using for live video lectures, uh, Collaborate, is uh, embedded there. Uh, the Zoom is now, although it's still in its infancy as uh, something that's integrated with, uh, integrated with Canvas. But there are other applications that you can use for videos for sharing of, uh, sharing of material. There are applications you can use for, uh, for peer review that again, depending on the instructor you might see uh, that when students go on to the individual Canvas site for their course, if they look in the left sidebar menu, they should be able to see all the applications that they will have to use. I mean, on my own, they will see Collaborate, they'll see Zoom, they will see a link to the library online course reserves. Uh, and the library has been, you know, I can't praise the library enough in what it's done in, uh, enabling a sort of smooth interface between the Canvas sites and access to the material on course reserve and making as much as possible available in a fully online format or streaming, uh, or streaming format. Uh, so you'll see all your applications there. That's where you'll see discussions. Uh, submission of assignments will be different that, uh, and again, this might depend on individual instructors. Some might actually prefer students to simply email them the assignments uh, directly. Others will use the assignment Dropbox tool uh, on the Canvas site, which allows students to upload their, uh, their assignments there. Robert, did you use anything else cool and exciting in your course? Not really, that pretty much sums it up. I used Zoom for discussion, I used Zoom for recording lectures. And uh, actually I also used, um, so one thing I did a little bit differently for my um, pre-recorded lectures is I used audio lectures rather than video lectures. And uh, you will have some profs doing that. There are certain advantage to audio lectures for some courses. Um, one student's found the flexibility of audio lectures um, particularly nice because they could be listened to, they could be, uh, you know, consumed 
on the phone, on the move, wherever it might be, you weren't tied to a screen to do so. Um, but you know, I, I basically used the, the standard suite of tools because those are the ones students are familiar with. And I think the majority of colleagues will use those. Um, you may find a, a few uh, sort of like linking out to courses and things like WordPress that they already have pre-prepared and they didn't want to migrate across to Canvas. Um, so there might be a few sort of um, variations on it, but I think most people will be using Canvas as the home base as uh, developer and also then thinking about um, you know, Zoom will collaborate ultra as the, as the medium of uh, dissemination. We do have a few colleagues who post their um, recorded lectures on YouTube as well. That's, that's another option that some people do like. Um, but there are pros and cons to all these things. Of course. Um, just a shameless plug for uh, myself. We, the Department of English will be sending out a student resource guide in the next upcoming weeks that lists uh, a bunch of potential resources, many of which are through the library actually. Um, so that students can hopefully get familiar and get some resources if they need any help with the tech platforms. Um, but we do have a question in the chat, so I'm just going to read that out to both of you. Um, from Helena, how should students who are not in BC get the books they will need for courses? I've heard that there can be delays with buying books from the UBC bookstore to be delivered elsewhere. Any yeah. comments on that? I'll, I'll jump in to start off, I think. Um, hi, Helena, thanks for the question. Um, there's, uh, it, it's a tricky one. I think colleagues who I have talked to have been careful in selecting the course texts that they're using this year and are trying to use as many course texts that have e-versions available as they possibly can. Now, there are some that don't, and so there'll be an unavoidable physicality to those texts. Um, I'm trying to with all of my texts. I think I've got about 95% of my texts available also as e-texts now. And, and in that case, of course, it's very easy. You click the button and suddenly you have it. And you have less money, but you have the text. Um, it all happens without any physicality at all. Um, in, in the case of those texts that are not available as e-publications, um, to be honest, I, and that might sound a little disloyal saying this, I would uh, order it from a large online retailer such as Amazon or whatever your country's particular equivalent might be. Um, you're more likely to get quicker service than the bookstore because the bookstore is not a specialized online retailer. Um, it's doing its best. Uh, but that's not why it exists. I will add a particular uh, problem that's arisen with that, and that's in courses uh, where I've been teaching or where I will be teaching uh, what I can best describe as modern or contemporary novels. It's somewhat easier to deal with the bookstore if you're just using, if either if you can just order print copies of things and assume that people will go physically to the bookstore and pick them up, uh, although that has its problems too, uh, or if you are using academic uh, editions of texts because there has been a real effort on the part of many academic publishers to put as much material as possible in uh, digital editions for this fall, you know, with so many universities going to uh, partial or complete online course delivery. But where I'm teaching modern novels or popular material, quite often this material does not exist in academic uh, electronic editions, and the bookstore somehow seems hesitant to order, maybe they simply can't, uh, order some sort of card that enables you to buy them in, you know, Kindle or Kobo or Google Play or whatever sort of digital edition. So what I've done in those cases is I've ordered a few print editions. I told the bookstore, use your discretion. If you don't think anybody will buy them, don't, you know, don't order them. But then in the course description, the preliminary course description I've put on my blog, I've indicated what digital platforms they're available in. And I made sure to choose texts that were available on at least, I chose four digital platforms to look at. Uh, and they had to be available on at least three of them for me to set the text. Oh, so I put that there. And then you can choose your own adventure. And the thing about the digital platforms is you don't really need an e-reader for them. You can mm -hmm. read them on a website. 
yeah, many of them tend to be browser based now. For one of my grad courses, I'm using a, I'm teaching a number of graphic novels and yeah. you just get the text through comics comics ology, which yeah. I can't yeah. even and pronounce. It's lovely. Um, yeah, it's and it's a very very efficient way of uh, of, of getting text down to students. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's been some uh, really cool kind of innovations. I know a few professors that I've talked to have used uh, exactly what you're talking about, kind of like podcast lectures. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one thing that I'm super jealous of, as well as uh, kind of the transition to online e-readership available uh, texts. Uh, kind of switching topics a little bit here, but one of the mm -hmm. most common concerns that came up when we were polling students about what they were worried about the upcoming semester um, is FaceTime both with their peers, uh, discussion with their peers, as well as being able to get uh, FaceTime with professors. I was wondering if you guys could talk a little bit about what so sort of the best ways to get to know professors would be um, and what sort of the best way to get to know the other people in your class would be if you're online. Well, that, that's a tricky one. <laughs> um, that's okay. um, it, it is a tricky one. We, we're, on the online teaching platforms, the online university this year is going to make that more difficult. We just say that at the start. It is going to be more difficult. It's going to be more difficult for the students to get to know us and each other. It's going to be more difficult for us to get to know the students. That's just the nature of the beast. Um, however, a lot of profs, uh, a lot of, the co of my colleagues are building in architectures around their courses to attempt to provide some kind of forum for interaction. Um, these can take a number of different forms. For example, um, going back to what Giselle mentioned earlier, the discussion forums on Canvas can be very productive with regards to this. In my summer course, I set up a number of questions every week in my discussion forums, thinking that this might work as it had worked in previous years where you get a few student questions and a little bit of back and forth. Um, I had hundreds of contributions from students every week in there and so many that I didn't even get to read them all because there were so many and the students would go off on these long discursive debates with each other that would just spiral off in all sorts of directions and I was thrilled for them. Basically I saw it as replicating that kind of hey let's go for a coffee and talk about the lecture after the lecture moments that students cherish so much. So discussion forums can do that in one way. Other people are building up, um, for example, other people are instituting Slack channels for their courses um, and asking their student body to come online maybe an hour before the, the lecture to chat or whatever it might be, or at least giving them opportunities. Um, a little bit more formally, what a lot of profs are doing is taking the traditional office hours and turning them into open Zoom office hours. So instead of saying, I'll be in my office from three to four on a Wednesday, they'll say, I'll be hanging out in the Zoom room three to four on Wednesday, please stop by and chat with me. Um, and whereas it used to be the case that if you were sitting in your dorm room and you thought, oh, I really don't want to walk through the rain to chat to my prof about nothing much, um, clicking on a button and having a chat for 10 minutes about the course is very, very easy for most people. So perhaps that might even be an advantage. And I can see some colleagues continuing the tradition of Zoom uh, office hours uh, post pandemic, to be honest, because they're very efficient. Um, we've all gone into our office um, for only office hours on a particular day and interrupted a research day to do that to find absolutely nobody has turned up. To be able to do that from the luxury of your home kitchen table or home office if you're lucky enough to have one is 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 a really nice innovation so you know there's there's some things that are advantages as well as disadvantages about the whole thing i hadn't thought about that giselle mm. do you have anything yes. um, a great advantage too is that they tend to be quite comfortable with this technology they tend to be quite comfortable with the uh, you know face-to-face -face, um video conferencing uh, systems and they're built in and you can either set them up so that it can be you know maybe a, a meeting with one student as you might set up in a regular regular office hour or it can be and I've set these up a couple of you know actually several times on collaborate I'll set up what I call not a lecture but what I call a, a Q&A and it, you know, it might be in the run up to an assignment or in the run up to, uh, to an exam. And, you know, people can come in and they can, you know, they can bring questions and then we can end up talking about the questions. And uh, 
I found on the whole that first years were more enthusiastic about this than, uh, you know, than the upper level course, interestingly, uh, interestingly enough. But uh, with the first years, no, they were really, really quite keen on this and quite appreciative, uh, appreciative of it. I think also the use of it, uh, even if you only use it for the synchronous lectures, is it does give students an opportunity to see this person who is actually teaching a uh, teaching course, you know, it gives them some sort of. So that is one of the ways in which, because we are urged to differentiate what we're doing, uh, in, you know, as this pandemic measure from the distance ed model of online courses, which is different in terms of structure, different in terms of, uh, uh, and different in terms of, of delivery. It really does assume much more independent work on the part of the, on the part of the student and self-organization of time. Whereas this is a lot more like the 13 week structured, scheduled, uh, system. And so I find that the video lectures give you that component that, you know, you would expect from that anyway, which is actually getting to see the person teaching, uh, teaching the course. So. Absolutely. Um, a terrible voice. <laughs> oh, no, you're doing great. Um, we also have a reminder from the ESI, ESA, which is the English Students Association, that they'll be hosting kind of informal peer-to-peer uh, -peer events throughout the year. So if there's any students listening um, who are hoping for that kind of peer to peer contact or want to discuss more about uh, just getting to know people. That well, will definitely be so cool. the year. It's such a wonderful, I know. A wonderful, wonderful part yeah. of the department. A lot Get of involved. students have been involved in it. And yeah, it, it's absolutely. Great. Absolutely. Um, all right. So sorry, I'm just looking through my questions that I have for you guys. Uh, oh, yeah. You mentioned earlier, I think Giselle, uh, that most lecture or most courses will have some sort of synchronous uh, portion to it. So whether that's some sort of lectures or uh, discussion space, is that going to be true for all courses? Will all courses have some sort of face-to-face uh, -face contact or um, no? Okay, I can't, uh, I, I, I don't think I'm really well placed to, to answer that. Sure. Sure. To a certain extent, it does depend on the individual instructor. All I can say is that we have really been encouraged to have some synchronous uh, activity that actually does require the students to be logged in and to be, uh, and to be present at specific times. This is also to discourage a notion that because the courses are online, you might be able to take, you know, say two courses in the same time slot, and that's not going to be, uh, not going to be a possibility. And other courses in other disciplines might actually be considerably stricter about the synchronous elements of the of the course so i hadn't even considered trying to sign up for two courses at the same time <laughs> wow yeah uh, well, robert anything from you students who've done who've done this i don't know how they've managed to do it but uh, <laughs> they, have, they have done it and then they discover to their horror that uh, that they've done it Oh, we, we, we have a question, a new question in chat. We do. It says, when can we expect to hear whether second term will be online or in person? But I was under the impression that it has recently been announced that term two Yesterday. is online. Yeah. Uh, is yeah. that true? Okay. A communicate came out to staff and faculty yesterday telling us that, again, the language is a little um, vague, that term two will be primarily online. And then it left it to the faculties to communicate exactly what this means. Now, my understanding at present for in terms of the arts faculty is that it's going to be the same rules as term one. So there will be very limited in-person tuition, um, which will be limited to such things as music and performing arts and some of those courses that really, really cannot be done in any way effectively online. But there has been some talk over the past few months that some departments, not ours, but some departments may be thinking of some 
in-person um, teaching, but that's yet to be confirmed. So we really do have to wait for a, um, an announcement from the Dean of Arts about exactly what Arts's policy moving forward into term two is going to be. Um, Helena asks a, a follow-up question there about graduate English courses. Yes, they will be online. Um, as far as I know, unless things have changed since last time I talked to our head of department, which was about three minutes ago uh, via email. Uh, so that, that's my understanding is uh, th th it's, it's a complex question. And we did poll faculty about their willingness and desire to bring some small seminars back face to face. But ultimately, we had a discussion about this and the risks outweigh the benefits, especially in terms of those small seminars, uh, because first of all, you couldn't bring it back 100% online because we have many international students who will still be off site. So you'd be forced immediately to teach a hybrid model, uh, which brings up equity issues about certain students getting a higher quality of tuition than students who can't actually be in class for reasons that are just obvious, I think. The other, the other equity issue it brings up is if a certain prof is um, perhaps willing to put their own health in jeopardy, even in a tiny, tiny risk environment, what happens if that prof gets sick? Who teaches their other courses? What's the fallout? What's the quarantine for those students who all might happen to be in other classes as well? There's all sorts of like, um, you know, butterfly chaos theory implications for, for making a decision like that. So our department has made the decision that it is safer and it is more sensible to stick with the status quo for, the, for term two. And I recognize what you said earlier about there necessarily being some differences and also some downsides to teaching online. But I do think that in the English department, we're pretty lucky in that uh, a lot of our courses don't have labs and a lot of what we do is, is reading and thinking about it and talking about it. And those are things that uh, transition better online to a lot of other, uh, a lot of other types of learning. So we are pretty That's lucky right. in that aspect. That's right. There's also another, that one of the things about this year um, is that we are discovering things about technology and teaching that we didn't know before or that we should have known before, but we didn't have to think about it because we weren't all forced to do it. Um, one of the things that has been very helpful for teaching synchronous live, live classes for me is the chat window on the side. Oh, yeah. We all know that some students are very reticent to speak in class. They're not going to be the student who interrupts you in the middle of your lecture flow to, to ask a question that they're not sure of. Um, when I'm teaching live now, I have a stream of questions coming down the side. Now, at, at academic conferences, we've seen this for a while because there's often a kind of um, Twitter sub-conversation yeah. going on about a particular academic um, panel or paper that everyone in the audience is following both the Twitter conversation and the live performance. So what yeah. we have here is we have an immediate... Yeah. Yeah, and some conferences have gone as far as broadcasting the Twitter stream along the along the on a, on a screen in front of the person, so you can see some very interesting stuff going on. Um, but this has been so so helpful f to get an immediate feedback, and it helps counter the problem with Zoom or Collaborate Ultra that it's very difficult to read the room in front of you as you can in a live classroom. You can't see if students are getting what you're talking about. You can't see. Uh, a number of confused faces that causes uh, that pauses causes you to pause and readdress a particular point, but in the chat we can get a certain degree of replication of that immediate feedback, and that's been, you know, I would to be honest, um, if I was told that I could go back into the classroom tomorrow now, I would set up some kind of chat screen next to me and allow students to ask questions via chat in a live classroom because it's just so helpful. That is so cool. Very, very interesting. Yeah, it's kind of the augmented classroom. If you think about it's that actually way. something that I've, uh, you know, that I've thought about for several for several years, uh, because I've often found that very conventional models of participation in class do tend to privilege, you know, what I think of as the sort of very keen student, the extroverted students, the one I think about the little girl and the others when. Um, uh, their mother is quizzing them on their catechism and she asks them, can you identify the four hells? And she, yeah, me, 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 ask me. Uh, and then there are a lot of students and I have to say, I was that student as, uh, as an undergraduate. I was a little mouse. I, my favorite place was in the library, sitting between the stacks of books, 
this was pre-online. I went to university when dinosaurs roamed the earth. That was my favorite place. And I probably didn't say anything in class until about my last year as an undergraduate. Then you couldn't shut me up. But, uh, but I always feel for those students. And I think they do have things to say. It's only that they need a different model of contribution. So chat has been wonderful for that. And online discussion, the text-based discussion forums. Also, in a class where you have 50 minutes to talk and you have 45 students, not everybody's going to have an opportunity to speak. And somebody's great idea might occur to them on the bus on the way home or when they're eating their dinner or washing the dishes later on. Oh, I wish I'd said that. This way, instead of hoping it'll stick in their mind and they'll have an opportunity to say it next time, they can go onto Canvas, go into discussions and say, hey, this idea occurred to me when I was washing the dishes and you know, here's what I think about what happens in this particular uh, episode of the text we're looking at. Very, very cool. Is there any other aspects of online teaching that you have found to be particularly useful, even the, to the point that you might miss them or try to implement them in courses? after it's done? I'm it's okay always, to say no. <laughs> uh, I'm always going to have learning management systems as, uh, you know, as long as I'm teaching, they're always going to augment, you know, if I do, which I, I hope, uh, return to classroom teaching before I retire, uh, you know, I will always have a, a learning management system to augment it, to uh, you know, sort of extend what we can do in a class period beyond that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd agree. I think uh, there will be more of an uptake of um, LMS use. Um, I think there'll be more of an uptake of many of the tools that many of us have been, uh, again, forced to discover in the learning management systems. Um, and you know, I, I think that will become part of whatever the new normal in terms of face-to-face -face teaching becomes afterwards. Out of curiosity, more of a personal question than anything. When I was a student, I really looked forward to lectures. Oftentimes, that was the only thing that kind of kept me doing my readings and keeping up in class was the fact that I would have to sit in front of the professor and <laughs> know what's happening or not know what's happening. Um, what advice would you give for students who may or may not have a hard time kind of keeping up with the online curriculum because it is a little bit more uh, isolated and a little bit more focused on them and their own time management skills? Yeah, it's really tricky. Um, motivation is going to be difficult for everybody. Um, to be honest, this is not only a problem or not only an issue that affects students. You know, if you think about the way in which many profs teach, walking the, the, the physical act of walking into a classroom, which is a performative act, puts you into a performative state where your adrenaline rises, you go into a certain kind of teacherly mode, and then you're on for 50 minutes or 120 minutes or sorry, or, or sorry, 80 minutes or whatever the, the time frame might be, that's difficult to replicate when you're sitting in your paddock at 11 p.m. at night and you're thinking, oh, I have to record a lecture on something, right? Where do I, how do I notch up my passion? How do I notch up this? Um, how do I replicate that sort of um, professorial mode? So we're all gonna be struggling with that a little bit. Um, and I think for, for many students, it's gonna be a term in which they're gonna have to be more organized. Um, they're going to have to be holding themselves to account in terms of readings because as you point out there is often a motivation I must get this done because I have class at nine o'clock tomorrow morning So I'll be up till three reading this novel um, or, or whatever that might look like now One of the things I've been encouraging my first years to do I'm teaching um, a couple of jumpstart um, sessions at the moment is to think about uh, virtual check-ins with their uh, with friends or colleagues. They don't even have to be friends in the university at UBC. They can be friends going to other universities, most of which will be online too, uh, to, to talk about where they are and to hold each other to account in terms of uh, the, the workloads that they have. And also, to be honest, give someone to whine about things to, right? Because that's what you kind of miss in the online environment is that kind of sort of um, casual support systems that, that other members of the class will provide you. Accountability buddies, that's a lovely term from there. there. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, re that's really that's handy. So building online support systems in, in a time when we don't have those things. Academics are doing it too. Profs are doing it too. Um, the rise of the Zoom cocktail hour amongst administrators 
has been uh, a big thing this summer. Um, it's been a very present part of administrative life. Yeah, so that would be my advice to students is um, build a support network online. Great. Uh, Giselle, anything? Um, okay. I'm very comfortable online, so, uh, you know, I'm quite famous for telling students I check my email 300 times a day, uh, to the point that now I'm actually at the point where I'm sort of forcing myself to structure my time and to have a little structured time away from, uh, you know, being constantly available and not always dealing with the email as it comes in at three o'clock in the morning, because I keep very odd hours. Uh, Robert's quite right about the performative uh, element of, uh, of lecturing and uh, the difference between that sort of performance and what we're, what, we're doing, uh, what we're doing here, because it does involve that sort of physical going to the class and getting whatever tech you might want to use in the classroom set up and, you know, getting it, uh, getting it to work and, you know, getting everybody settled and, you know, seeing that the desks are arranged properly. And then, of course, when you're lecturing that way, after I gave up sitting on the front of the front of the desk, I used to teach at places that had these big, sturdy desks, not these tables that are rickety and fall apart. I used to sit on the front of the desk and talk to my students. Now I tend to sort of walk back and forth and, you know, make sure that everybody gets enough attention. Whereas sitting here in this chair looking at uh, looking at the camera unable to make eye contact with anybody because part of performance is I, I think this probably differs from theatrical performance where uh, you're trying not to make eye contact you know you're in character and you're kind of looking uh, looking beyond but lecturing you do make eye contact quite often you know somebody smiles or somebody laughs you know, when they laugh at your jokes, you're always so happy. Uh, it's quite different from looking, you know, what I call looking at the green light, because that actually makes it look as if you're looking at them. And with the interface, not actually, uh, not actually seeing people. It's not impossible, but it does require... What it requires, and I, I, I say this as somebody who has a long history of enthusiastic involvement with internet-based uh, technology, it is requiring a sort of shift in perception of it and a shift in the way that you perceive communicating uh, with people. I find that doing the two summer courses and attending various Zoom meetings has actually been very good practice for this. So. I hope so. I can, uh, I can imagine that it would be difficult if you're used to sitting in front of a lecture and kind of feeling the energy of all the students and seeing who's looking at you and who's asleep uh, versus sitting in a Zoom call where you don't get that feedback. That, that would be very, very difficult. Um, well, I know our professors are busy, so I do want to wrap up within the next few minutes, but I just wanted to ask if there's any last advice, anything that you would like to say say to students as instructors, I know that we're all going into this kind of crazy, unprecedented semester together, um, but there's a lot of question marks and appreciate the camaraderie. Any last words? Don't be afraid to ask. I mean, we're being encouraged as we're developing our Canvas sites and our uh, course outlines and syllabi to be as transparent as possible and as explicit as possible from the start of term. Don't you know, save any surprises for later about what students can expect to do, what they can expect the ex uh, experience to be like, how they're going to be evaluated. But even at that, there are going to be questions. Students are going to have questions. Never, ever, ever be afraid to ask, uh, ask questions. Never feel, oh, this will make me look ignorant. No, it makes you look engaged. It makes you look, uh, you, you want to find this out so that you have your best chance of success. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, that's such an important thing, this term. I think that that kind of engagement and being able to, you know, open yourself up to, to ask those kind of questions. Um, my piece of advice would be reactive rather than uh, proactive. You know, um, Giselle's is very proactive there. Get in early, sort of make sure these things. Mine would be reactive. And that is, so th there's one of the novels I read 
many times growing up with Douglas Adams's uh, um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, a novel which many people will be familiar with. Um, and there's a, there's a visual motif in that of a big red button that says, don't panic, right? Um, that would be my advice for this term for students because things will go wrong this term. It's unavoidable that things will go wrong at some point, may, maybe not in every course, but certain courses that you take will have some kind of technological disaster. Um, you know, from the scale of, you know, you miss a midterm for your internet going out through to the other end of the scale, which means maybe your instructor has health issues and has to leave the course. That is quite possible in the time of pandemic. We hope not, but that is possible too. There are, there's a whole range of different things and students may have health issues too uh, during this whole period. You know, we have a lot of students. It's inevitable that some students will be personally impacted. Um, don't panic. <laughs> there, there are accommodations available. Contact us. If you can't contact the individual instructors, contact the department, contact Arts Advising. You will not be left afloat during this semester. Um, the university, the department, our faculty is, is, is committed to getting people through this, um, this very strange, exceptional period of online teaching that is new to everybody and is gonna have missteps and therefore do not panic, um, seek help. If you require it, if you don't, that's great too. Um, yeah, I think that there's there's lots of resources for both students and teachers and while like we can't predict everything that's gonna happen and is difficult, I think that um, definitely reaching out to professors, reaching out to your peers uh, and looking around DBC resources is gonna be helpful. Um, maybe just to sum it all up in the words of Douglas Adams, don't panic and bring a towel. There's lots of resources yeah. available and yeah, your towel. it'll be okay. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. Well, we're just about out of time. So thank you guys so much for chatting with us. You guys are making me jealous that I don't get to take classes this semester just to kind of see how it's going to turn out. Uh, but I have no doubts that it's going to go uh, just as smoothly as it possibly can. And I'm excited to hear how it goes. So thank you guys so much for... Uh, chatting with us for a little bit and we'll be uploading this to Canvas. Uh, so hopefully some students can make sure to get their advice and uh, go into the semester with a feeling a little bit more prepared. Thank you very, very much. Yeah. We'll see you all later.